Something about uh, elderberries, too. I could, I know, I could tell the vampire story. Any of you watch Sesame Street? Any, it, a, a lot of you are homeschooled. They're like, Sesame Street parents are like, no. <laughs> so, so for you older people, who on Sesame Street teaches you to count? The count. Now, this is why I was a problem child to my parents, because I'm like a five-year-old watching Sesame Street. I'm going, why is a blood-sucking creature of darkness teaching me my numerals? My parents could not answer this. I now know the answer. I'll tell you later. Do do cliffhanger. Yep. So I'm John. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to start with a different story. Um, so imagine it's like a decade ago. And that echo really is something, by the way. So it's about a decade ago. And, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon at the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection in the state of Wisconsin. Just another bureaucratic day, shuffling papers, afflicting taxpayers, doing other such things that you do in bureaucratic offices across America. And in walks somebody you're not expecting. In walks a guy by the name of Max Kane. Now, Max Kane does not mean anything to any of you people, most likely. You've probably never heard of Max, which is kind of sad because um, Max has probably done more to secure and protect your freedoms than the entire Republican Party combined. Um, and you never heard of the guy. And he walks into the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. And he goes looking for someone, namely the guy who is in charge of that department. This guy is not expecting Max Kane. Now, this guy talks about Max Kane quite often. Actually, on the back of the guy's door, he probably has a dartboard with Max Kane's picture on the back of his door in his nice, cushy government office because of all the things Max has done to make this guy's life very, very difficult. And now this guy who you have for three or four years been seeking to jail, shut down and do other such things to is standing right in front of you, unannounced at your door. We'll find out more about Max in a little bit, because um, what I want to talk about is fighting the government. You know, I have a very weird CV as a seminary student. I graduated from Southern Seminary in 2005. Uh, before I graduated, I was dating this really, really cute girl. And before I proposed to her, I decided I needed to tell her something very, very important. So I take her out to a really nice restaurant and we're at this really nice restaurant. She actually thought that maybe at the restaurant, I'm, you know, like, like this is the night. They were all dolled up. This, really, like, like this is, this is and we're sitting at the restaurant. We get most of the way through the meal. I'm like, hey, Jessica, I need to tell you something important. And she's like, you know, I'm like, um, one day I'm probably going to jail. <laughs> now, fast forward to around 2012. Um, after the Kentucky state government at the behest of the federal government raided one of my businesses and threatened me with jails, fines, and um, having to share a jail cell with a guy named Jimbo. Um, she looks at me and she goes, do you remember when you told me um, you might go to jail one day? I'm like, yeah. She's like, you weren't kidding. I'm like, what do you mean I wasn't kidding? Like, that's what I told you. Um, so, you know, I have a little bit of a CV in trying to get yourself arrested, picking fights with various state and federal agencies. Uh, but before we can talk about fighting the government, I want to start with a simple question. Uh, can you fight the government or when can you fight the government? You know, because I asked Tim, I'm like, has anybody talked about Romans 13? at this event? Like, have they ever just like taken a quick run at Romans 13? What does Romans 13 actually have to say? What, what are kind of typical views of Romans 13 held throughout church history? And he's like, well, no, nobody's really talked about Romans 13. So we're going to briefly talk about Romans 13 because you can't talk about how to fight the government or why to fight the government unless you know you can fight the government. And a lot of Christians don't think you can. That's the first understanding of Romans 13. Um, it was really funny. Because, you know, this, this is a Quaker camp. It's in the Anabaptist tradition. 
And instead of putting Jesus and politics on the sign, I just think they couldn't bring themselves to do that. So they put Jesus versus politics. Um, but, but this is, um, you know, a lot of Amish people right now across our country are facing legal action from federal and state governments. You almost never hear about it because of the world you live in. And any of them who choose to fight are often ostracized by their communities because they have a view of Romans 13 that says, you just can't fight. It is always wrong for you to fight. You just can't do it. It is never permissible. Um, a crazy dude who I came across, D.G. Hart. Uh, some of you know who he is. You know, some people say, well, you can fight but just realize it's always, you know, like, oh, yeah, you can fight. But listen to what D.G. Hart says. Um, Nero did not violate God's law if he executed Christians who obeyed God rather than men. If Paul continued to preach after the emperor said he may not, then Nero was doing what God ordained government to do. Ooh. I don't know what Cracker Jack box seminary that guy went to, <laughs> but, but, but he's, he, he might as well say, well, you can't fight after all, you know, because it, it's the same thing as saying you can't fight if this is the view you hold. Um, so there's a lot of people who say you can't fight. I don't think such a view is compatible with the Bible. Jesus says um, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. What are gates? Gates are defensive structures. Gates are not offensive structures. When Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against us, he has envisioned an offensive element to his people's work and commission. So the second view, which should be completely non-controversial, is we are never to obey officials who command things clearly contrary to Scripture. So you see this in Calvin's Institutes. We are subject to men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord if they command anything against him. Let us not pay the least regard to it, nor be moved by the dignity which they possess as magistrates. Um, there's a problem, though, with this view that I discovered when I was in seminary. So, you know, my professors would say, oh, yes, when the government clearly commands things contrary to scripture, when the government is clearly doing things contrary to the scriptures, we must disobey them because it's better to obey God than men. And then ask these guys, when have you ever disobeyed the government? When? Our government is like bombing countries right now with your two, when? What, you know, I, I'm like, like, so I started asking every Christian I ever met, because I didn't grow up Christian. I was saved in college my sophomore year of college, 1997, was in seminary in 2000. So, so all of you people were weird to me. <laughs> I did not grow up among you. Um, so you, you all would tell me things like, oh, yes, we, well, we must obey God rather than men. Well, like, well, when did this ever happen, this mystical obeying God rather than men? Francis Schaeffer started making trips to the United States, I believe it was in the 1970s. And after a number of his trips to the United States, he was appalled. And he commented, he looked at the churches and he goes, you all are doing nothing. Murder of babies, you do nothing. Uh, the teaching of evolution and basically rank paganism in your public, you do nothing. Francis Schaeffer, actually advocated back in the 1970s that Christians in mass should withhold tax revenue from the federal government. But even, even he noticed, like, it's um, the second view of Romans 13. It's like the unicorn that you never find. It, it just, everybody tells me, well, this is what Christians are required to do biblically, but it's not something I've ever actually met a Christian who did. <laughs> Have you? Can anyone point to a single Christian you know who in some way disobeyed the government because the government was commanding things contrary to the scriptures or doing things contrary to the scriptures? It just doesn't exist. So the third view, um, which is kind of the view I fall into, um, you see this view um, with Baxter and a few other people, is that um, anytime the government commands things contrary to scripture, 
or anytime the government is egregiously harming the common good, or a magistrate is just egregiously in sin, Christians have a duty to stand up to the magistrate. So you see this here, Richard Baxter, all government that is lawful for God's glory and the common good, and laws that certainly are notoriously against God and the common good. Whoa, I guess this might have got mauled when I copied it. Um, so all laws that are certainly and notoriously against God and the common good have no true obliging power to formal obedience on the soul. Rona, anyone? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Um, it, it was, you know, you, you see this also in Knox. Um, John Knox, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Um, the Baptist historian, James Ryahan, um, he points out that, that in Baptist political thinking, the magistrate who serves by divine appointment must, so the magistrate who serves by divine appointment must be a terror to those who promote evil, must be. Dude, this stuff killed me when I, cause I went to seminary. So you're like, you must be a smart guy. You would be wrong. Um, I, you know, we never learned any of this Baptist political history. We never learned anything about how to interact with magistrates. I had to go to like crazy guys like Matt Truella to discover that there's all this stuff in my own heritage. Um, so that's the third view. And, th and that's the view I kind of fall into. That obviously whenever... A magistrate commands things or does things clearly contrary to the scriptures, they have forfeited their authority. Just like when a father is abusive to his wife and children. Um, early Puritan America, that this is a wild thing to think about. Early Puritan America, New England, um, 1620s through 1680s. If you were a father who was neglectful of your family duties, the community would take your children and rehome them. And there's nothing you could do. Because their view was God has given different people different types of authority. And if they misuse or abuse that authority, the authority is no longer fit for them. And we have a duty to take the authority away. I'm like, man, that's my kind of Christianity. That That, that is a muscular... God will be glorified whether you want him to be or not type of approach to family life, approach to church life, approach to denominational life, approach to political life. And then, of course, there's the fourth view. Um, these are people who I would not get my political theology from. They are all of like the hardcore Ron Paul anarcho-capitalists who I ran around with in the early 2010s. Do not get political advice from them, but I regret almost every day I did not take their advice on Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, it's really true. I like these crazy dudes were trying to get arrested by the federal government 2012, 2013. Like, you should buy Bitcoin, John. Like, yeah. So, so that's the fourth view, though. Th these are like the angry teenagers that are running around in some of your churches, even though they're like 43 years old. <laughs> and, and they're just like, you know, um, the, the, the government says I have to record who I sell chickens to. Like, we must burn down the state capital. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, come on. Like, the government tells you what light bulb you can use and how many gallons of water your pooper can put down with you. <laughs> I was like, you're going to get upset over chickens. I'm like, you're not a serious person. But you have these people running around in your churches that, you know, like, like, like literally like, like, like everything, everything is an, you know, everything is tyranny, tyranny, you know, everything. Um, and there is a lot of tyranny going around, but not all tyranny is equally worth our attention. Um, so, so, you know, so these are the four views. I, I think... At the very least, you have to be the second view, and you've heard my warning about the second view. Because again, the second view, just, I, I, you know, again, can anyone in the room point to a person you know who actually, at some point in your living lifetime, obeyed the second view on the scriptures, that you got to obey God rather than men? 
Might have been a few churches who did that during Rona and a few pastors who did that during Rona. Um, but, but those are rare, to say the least. But I'm the third view, that, that as Christians, we have a duty when magistrates begin to harm our neighbors to intervene on their behalf. We should be the first rank of the Spartan spear line when a magistrate needs curtailed and kowtowed and brought to heel because he is no longer serving God. He is serving himself. Um, so that's when, when can you fight? When magistrates command things contrary to scriptures, when magistrates are acting in ways that are injurious to your community and your country. And some of you are going, John, this is long overdue. It is. It is exceptionally overdue, as numerous historians and church theologians like Schaefer have been noting for decades. One reason we are at the point we are now is that when we had easy opportunities to do these things, um, we did not. And, and so things just go from bad to worse. So that's when you can fight the government. Why should you fight the government? Um, you know, why is important, at least for Christians? I pick fights with the government for two reasons. One, because I really do think Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is, there is no one who can have authority that is greater to his. There is no one who can have authority that is equal to his. There is no one who can have authority that is comparable to his. And so when we stand up to the government, whether it's Rona or masks or, or a host of different nonsense things, we are declaring to them the gospel. We are declaring to them that there is a kingdom that is not of this world that we belong to, and its authority is greater than their authority. God, so, so for a Christian, um, you know, because again, like, I'm a fresh graduate from seminary, and I'm like primetime news in Kentucky for picking the greatest fight with the health department in the history of the health department. And all these people are like, well, you're just being self-seeking. You're just, no, no, I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm like, the only people in history who ever claimed to have a right to tell people what they could eat was the priestly class. And our government is no priestly class. Our government has no right to these kind of powers over me and my family. And me standing up to them is about God's glory, not mine. And then the second reason, it is about my neighbor's good. Um, so... Well, talking with the uh, Eschatology Matters folks reminded me of a story. Um, you, you've never heard of this guy either, most likely. His name is Sam Girard. So Sam Girard, he lived about an hour outside of Lexington, Kentucky. Amish guy, has probably more kids than you can fit in a wooden wagon. Um, and he made salve. So he, he made a salve that he would sell to people. Never once did a person, never once do you have a report of somebody who was harmed by the salve that Sam Girard made. Ne never once. Sam Girard was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. If not for Rona, once they got done leaving out all of like the rapists and the stealers and other people when they're leaving everybody out of jail during Rona, they finally let Sam Girard out. If it was not for Rona, he would still be rotting in a federal prison. See, because we talk about loving our neighbors, but do you know how many of your neighbors lost their businesses during Rona? because nobody would stand up with them to keep you, because you could go in Wally World. You know, our family had an elderberry business. We started the business in 2017. Um, in er, late 2019, early 2020, we broke six figures in sales. Years of my family's life spent building this business. By the beginning of 2021, 90% of our wholesale accounts 
we're gone from Kentucky forever. Because it's really hard to keep a business open when the governor says you're not allowed to be open. But, but how many people loved their neighbor by making sure their business wasn't arbitrarily and capriciously shut down for months on end? Wow, you could still get an abortion. You could still go, you could go to a strip club in Kentucky during Rona and you could not go to small boutique stores, said our governor. And the churches rolled over day after day after day. And, and then men I'm friends with, I went to seminary with, they're like, like, I don't understand why average people um, think our churches are so effeminate and think our churches are so worthless. I'm like, God gave you one of the greatest opportunities in modern history to demonstrate the truth of what you believe. And you kept your door shut for months and your neighbors were oppressed. I have friends who like could not get surgeries that they or their wife or children needed. And it took years off their lives or they died and you did nothing. And then you want people to respect you. I was like, God doesn't respect you. You're a sham. So, so I love my neighbor and I saw an area where my neighbors were being mistreated and I like William Wallace. And I was like, so I am going to go and I am going to pick a fight. I am going to pick a fight. Um, so now we're going to talk about how you fight with the government. Um, Cause again, strangely enough, I have um, more experience than the average bear. So uh, the first thing to know about if you ever want to fight with some aspect of the government is principles do not win wars. Principles do not win wars. Tactics and soldiers win wars. Conservatism is overran by worthless principled men. Uh, I could name a few, but I'm probably going to keep it off tape and leave it to what we discussed last night. <laughs> so no, no, like, like, what, like among conservatives, we're often like, well, we have the best ideas. We know we're right. Um, Pompey, uh, he, he was um, a, a, a person was mad at Pompey for conquering their village. And Pompey looked at the man and he said, don't quote laws to men with swords. Did you get it? No, your, your principles are worthless in the face of violence. And, and be assured, the other side is fully committed to the use of force against you. They have no qualms using force. They have no qualms making you uncomfortable. Principles are of no help when bullets start flying. Bullets don't care about your principles. Swords do not care about your principles. And again, principles are important. I don't want to say like principles aren't important. You know, if you're driving a car, principles tell you where you need to go, but they don't tell you how to drive. In a battle, principles tell you where you need to aim your cannons, but, but they don't tell you like how to shoot and other stuff. So you need good principles. But, but we are sorely lacking in our circles of men who will actually fight and men who know how to fight. And I'm going to take a very brief segue, depending on how much time I have. The way we are educating our boys is exasperating the problem. Most conservative Christians educate their boys as functional girls for the first two to three decades of their life and then wonder why they are worthless when they become husbands and fathers. How many of you, how many of your boys can quote Latin declensions and have no idea how to throw a left hook? How many of your boys, um, you know, study Spanish American history and have never read Sun Tzu? We tell our boys, oh, oh, son, God made you to be a warrior. Now let me raise you like a little girl until you're 23. Oh, can't miss piano lessons and we can't have Billy doing jujitsu. He might miss the recital. 
Most Christians raise their men as functional women, and then they bemoan the weakness that our men display when faced with the problems in our culture. If you want boys who are going to be willing to battle evil, then you have to raise them as warriors. And that has to be reflected in your church's preaching, in your church's priority, but in your home curriculum. So enough on that little rant. We'll move on. So no, but it's important because again, like, like I, I just meet, um, I, I made a, Nate Spearing, who some of you might have heard of, him and I were having a private conversation. He's an ex-special ops guy down in North Carolina, dear Christian brother. Um, he made a tweet um, about how he had to tell his wife that his boys were going to miss piano lessons because jujitsu was more important. And I mean, that tweet had like a thousand angry Christian women. It was amazing. You know, I'm just like, uh, you know, there's, there's like, you know, little Johnny needs arts and crafts. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's like, like little Johnny when he's 25 is going to think he's a girl. <laughs> so no, like, like it's a real, um, you know, it's a, it's a real problem. And, you know, this expands to other areas, though. This is one of the points I was going to make. Uh, to successfully fight the government. And again, my wife will tell you I love women. I have a wife and three little daughters who I cherish above all the riches in the world. Um, but you cannot let feminine proclivities coming from the women of both genders shape how you fight. So, uh, so you know, th this was a uh, th this is a story. I've altered the facts to protect a few of the people, just to be clear. But a few years ago, I came home from judo, and. My wife's like, oh, how was judo class? You know, what guy did you put to sleep and, and other such things? Um, and I tell her, you know, I go, yeah, I got to class. Um, I tell her who I work with. And she's like, oh, um, she's like, that younger boy is still coming. Now, this is an 11 year old boy who is closer to me in weight than he is to my 12 year old son. And while I'm at this class, um, the boy looks at me. He goes, well, where's your son, Noah? Because this Noah, my son, is who usually partnered with this young 11-year-old boy. And I look at the boy and I go, um, he lacks an appropriately sized partner. Because, you know, this is an 11-year-old boy who's almost 160 pounds. And my 12-year-old son is 90 pounds. Like, he's obese. And so I tell this to my wife, and my wife's immediate reaction is, aren't you worried you're going to hurt his feelings? And, and, and she catches herself because, you know, like she's been married to me for a long time. She's had to endure a lot. And she goes, she goes, oh, she goes, that's like really silly of me. I go, because feminine sensibilities are more worried about the boy's feelings than the fact that he is probably going to have a heart attack at 17 years old. They are more worried about him like suffering emotional trauma than him having type two diabetes. You know, ha have you watched some of the news interviews they're now doing with the parents of transitioning children? Every husband looks like he is in a hostage situation. It's just <laughs> like it is the wife who is talking and the husband is just like, you know, I I'm just like raise a finger. And, and we will send SWAT team to rescue you. Um, and we will try and find where you dropped your testicles along the way in this relationship. Um, because it should, it, it, so you cannot let feminine proclivities tell you how you can and cannot fight. Because because let's just be honest, there is almost no time you'll be allowed to fight. And isn't it isn't it just the truth? of like in the SBC in so many places for decades, we have just been told from women of both, oh no, you can't, oh, that'll hurt, that'll be divisive, that'll, that'll cause conflict. Man, can you imagine somebody saying to Paul on his way to confront Peter, Paul, Paul, Paul you're being divisive. <laughs> 
Paul, 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 don't you know Jesus prayed in John 17 for the we all Paul did not care. Paul threw down with Peter publicly to his face. Man, could you imagine what that was like for Peter? Could you imagine what was that like, you know, they didn't have air poppers back in that day, but that was like the time to like be selling popcorn in the church meeting as these two, you know, like as, as Paul basically gets up and is like, Peter, what are you thinking? What are you doing? So you cannot let women determine how you fight. Uh, third, framing. Framing and storytelling are the most important weapons that you start any battle with. So again, we're, we're conservatives. We have heroes like Ben Pencilneck Shapiro. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the left will do this horrible, evil thing. And somebody like Ben Shapiro will get on the news and he'll be like, here are nine different reasons supported by factual studies and history why these things are wrong. And, and then he, he will go on a factual tirade uh, of why whatever nonsense is wrong. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about your facts. Feelings do not care about facts. They just don't. So we learned in fighting with the government to wrap facts in the tasty candy of framing and stories. I've already hit you with a few stories that you're still waiting to hear more about. We won numerous court cases solely through the use of storytelling. One example, Vernon Hirschberger, farmer in the state of Wisconsin. Um, they started pouring ink in his uh, bulk tank for his milk for his farm because he was selling raw milk to his neighbors. Um, Vernon continued to sell raw milk anyway, so they eventually pulled him into court. He faced four different charges with more possible prison time than a rapist for raw milk. Welcome to a narco tyranny. Hope you're enjoying the ride. So Vernon um, heard about me and uh, me and my little band of misfits um, who had started traveling around the country helping people who were fighting the government. And we got up to Vernon's, you know, little rural area in Wisconsin. And we realized this is like the ideal situation. He's a little farmer in a rural county in Wisconsin, and he's going to be tried in the court that is in his county. So we worked with Vernon. We worked with all of his farm supporters for a couple months. We're like, you need to be in every newspaper. You need to be on every single radio show. There should not be a person within 500 miles of your farm who does not know your name and your story. You, you want a picture of you and your cute little Amish Mennonite wife and your 83 cute little Amish Mennonite children <laughs> on any time they think of your name. That is the picture we want them to think of. And we get to Vaudaire jury selection for Vernon Hirschberger's trial. And the um, judge in the courtroom goes, who in this room has heard about Vernon and his case? Every single person. Every single person had heard already Vernon's story. So even when the judge, 96 to 4, during the actual court case, sided against Vernon and for the state prosecution. It's an unbelievable record. It's like Pelosi's stock investing record. Um, for, for out of every hundred motions that were made during this trial, 96 were found in favor of the prosecution. You know, so what? That's like 24 to 1 ratio. Even with a completely stacked deck in court, Vernon got off on all three, char three of the four charges. He was only found guilty of the least of all the charges, mostly because the jury felt bad for the prosecutor, they said. 
framing and storytelling is everything in a fight. Th this is why like with all of the international nonsense going on, if you actually watch the news and I do not recommend it, they are selling you framing and storytelling. They are not selling you facts about these situations. And as conservatives, we tend to get so caught up on the facts that, that we miss the fact that like Jesus, what do you most remember about Jesus? Do you remember facts Jesus said? No, you remember the parable of the prodigal son. Do you remember like seven steps to get in, into heaven? No, you remember the pearl of great price. Like our Lord was a master of framing and storytelling. And we've totally lost sight of that in terms of its rhetorical social power. Why did LGBT nonsense become so readily acceptable by the culture? It is because of stories. It's because sitcoms and news and other people used stories to lull you and your neighbors into a false sense of security. And now it's overran everywhere because that is the power of stories. And you must be very good at storytelling. So when they raided my buying club, um, so this was Memorial Day 2011, uh, Kentucky State Department health inspector shows up at the buying club I founded, serves us with cease and desist and quarantine orders. Um, you know, little sign that says like, whoever breaks this quarantine order faces no less than $10,000 in fines and a minimum of two years in jail. Uh, lots of fun stuff. Well, my, my first response was to craft a story that, that would change, you know, because, because the, the government has a story. Well, J John's endangering public health. He's a renegade person with no regard for public safety and uh, people are going to die if, if he is allowed to exist. And so I, I used a different story. I used the story of the fact that Kentucky is one of the most obese and unhealthy states in America. It has a dying farmer class. We've went, we went from 10,000 dairy farms in 1995 to 800 dairy farms in 2015. So Kentucky like leads the nation in obesity, heart disease, and a whole bunch of things. And is it really in the best interest of the Kentucky State Health Department to use their limited resources going after the few people who are actually trying to be healthy in the state? They didn't like this story, especially when the media began to run with this story. Because another thing conservatives need to re-embrace is the power of mockery. So, uh, you know, like most of us are terrified of offending our wife and children, let alone offending somebody else, sadly. So we've lost this kind of um, willingness to inflict pain on other people. So, you know, one of the first things I learned when me and my son started judo seven years ago is, is there's no victory without somebody experiencing pain. <laughs> you know, you do martial arts, um, winning is winning through pain. And, and, and again, conservatives tend to think, well, pain is such a bad thing. We don't want, no, pain is love. Get, get this, get this, fix this in your mind. In God's economy, in a fallen world, one of the ways you most love sinful people is by being willing to inflict pain on them. We know this from Proverbs. You don't withhold the rod from... I really love this proverb where he says, you know, um, don't, don't regret, you know, swatting your child. Though they cry, they will not die. <laughs> I was like, man, you could tell Solomon his father, uh, you know, because like I, I had to discipline my two and a half year old earlier this week, really kind of for the first time. And he's just like, no, daddy, no, I don't want spank. Um, I'm like, then you should have obeyed. So, so you 
If you love people, you must be willing to inflict all sorts of pain upon them. Um, so like the Kentucky State Health Department, they reopened on Monday from, you know, they raided us on a Friday. I had all weekend to do terrible, horrible things to these people. And they reopened on Monday. And about a week later, a friend of mine who worked in another branch of the Kentucky State government, but like next door to the health department, he calls me. He's like, man, he's like, you should have been there when, re when they reopened. He's like, there has not been drama like this in Frankfurt in decades. <laughs> the, the, he, um, you know, basically, he described me, I am the boogeyman to the Kentucky State Health Department. Like, I'm what they look under their bed for at night because they want, like, if you love people, you will inflict, because again, when, when the government is a terror to the wrong type of people, you should become a terror to that branch of government until they restore biblical order and their biblical role. And so I became an absolute terror. I, I went on like news shows and radio podcasts. Um, and it was great. And, and things like these people were miserable because of me for weeks. And that misery was my gift of love to them. Because again, going back to what I said earlier, like, like I don't do this because I'm some kind of sadist. Okay, maybe, you know, especially with IRS agents, maybe. Um, you know, it, it, I do this because, you know, have you ever thought about, like, like, Joe Biden, as much as we despise him, he faces the judgment seat of Christ. So does the, like, these people, these people are image bearers who face what Hebrews said, is it is appointed for man to die once, and then they will face judgment. And because God in his providence has given them authority in an additional sphere, their punishment is going to be worse. So, so when I tussle with government actors, I'm really angling for an opportunity to see them come to repentance and faith in Christ. It is a gospel opportunity. Because th 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 this is the John the Baptist moment. Everybody loves to talk about John the Baptist. So like John the Baptist, like, like, you know, he was not beheaded because um, he thought Herod was a sexually immoral scumbag. Because almost everybody under Herod's rule knew Herod was a sexually immoral scumbag. John the Baptist was beheaded because he was the only one with the spine willing to publicly confront Herod over it. And if you love people, you will be willing to publicly mock them, embarrass them, make their lives miserable, and then offer them the hope of Christ. So... Um, you know, a good example of framing, if you want to see um, framing live examples, I don't agree with this guy on everything, but Spike Cohen on social media. He's like a hardcore, crazy libertarian guy, but, but he is infinitely effective at forcing mid and low level magistrates to do what is right through pain compliance. Um, so just a few days ago, he posted on one of his socials the story of a guy by the name of Joe Wood. And, I'm, you know, if you go check the story, I get a couple details wrong. I'm working straight from memory. But basically, Joe Wood is a guy living, on an RV, living in an RV on his daughter's property in Arizona. His daughter wants him to live there. Joe is a widower. He's a, you know, retired military veteran. He's not harming anyone living in an RV on his daughter's... He's actually blessing his daughter and his grandchildren by being right there involved in their lives. And some petty little bureaucrat in whatever little town Joe Wood lives in does not want him living in that RV on his daughter's property. And probably by the end of this week that petty little bureaucrat is going to be singing a different tune 
because of a single social media post by Spike Cohen. Pain compliance works, especially with low-level bureaucrats. These people's dreams lives is going into their office, giving everybody under their authority B minuses and C pluses, and then going home. Um, They don't like drama. They don't like phone calls. They, They don't like anything that interrupts their regularly scheduled programming. So it's amazing what you can accomplish, especially in more rural areas, in smaller towns, if you are willing to band together and inflict some discomfort on the comfortable and do it for the good of your community and the good of those around you. Uh, so the next thing is, if you're going to fight with the government um, and not end up, you will you know, this did happen to the January 6th people anyway. Um, you need to not go alone. So the, the government loves to play an isolate and execute type ball game because there's not that many people in the government. They are, they are still radically outnumbered, even with all the bloat and the bureaucracy. So in, in the war on local farmers, the war on food, but also in a number of different areas, They'll go after a single company, they'll go after a single farmer, they'll go after a single individual. So they served me these cease and desist and quarantine orders. And I was like, I'm okay with going to jail, but I'm taking my cellmates with me. Because at the time I was not a high ranking belt in any martial art and I weighed about 140 pounds and some 300 pound dude named Jimbo was not going to end up being my cellmate. If I'm going to jail, I am taking one of you with me <laughs> out of just personal preservation. So I got all of our buying club almost, just about every member to violate the quarantine and cease and desist together. This is beautiful because now if the state of Kentucky drags me in the court, The first thing my lawyer is going to say to the judge, where are the 212 other people who also violated the cease and desist and quarantine order? We've done this repeatedly when the government was harassing small individuals. We would just get hundreds of other individuals to do the same thing they were doing and then make the government enforce it. Do you know why marijuana is now legal in most of this country? People just did not obey. (laughs) It was really, like, it was not something that, it was just, it just got to the point that so many people were not complying. Uh, One of the most heartbreaking things to me during 2020 and 2021, in the entire state of Kentucky, how many businesses stood up to our governor? Kentucky is a state with like 23,000 or more total businesses. How many stood up to our governor? Any guesses? Two. One of them is owned by a family who do not even have American citizenship. They care more about liberty and righteousness than the people who are actually members of this country. Uh, the other one was Andrew Cooper Ryder. And, and so last thing I'm going to make is what time is it? What time do I need to be done? Uh, you know, I'm horrible with time. I have six children. I'm going on like 17 straight years of sleep deprivation. Um, so, so it's terrible. Um, so Andrew Cooper Ryder, he owned a small business in Kentucky. And, and, and his story is the perfect example of all these principles rolled into one to just make a bureaucrat miserable. So Andy Bashir shuts down Andrew Cooper Ryder's coffee shop. Andrew Cooper Ryder doesn't think this is right because you can still go to Wally World and you can still go to Costco, but you can't come to my coffee shop. You can still go to Kroger, but you can't come to my coffee shop. Um, so Andrew begins to do a series of videos Um, addressed to Governor Bashir, 
Andrew Cooper Ryder sits outside of the strip club in Lexington, Kentucky with a cup of coffee. And he goes, isn't it something? And, uh, and his, um, he, he got a coffee mug made that said Andy Bashir's Tears as he would drink it. Um, about three months into Rona, Governor Bashir basically had an entire task force created to solely deal with Andrew Cooper Ryder. That's how much trouble one guy with a camera and a sense of humor made for our governor. Because he'd be sitting there in front of the strip club going, yeah, it's kind of funny, isn't it, everybody? You can go in here and drink a cup of coffee, but you can't come to my... And he did this four or five times a week for months. He was a thorn in Governor Bashir's flesh. And, and I mean, his videos on Facebook, they would get millions of views because they were funny. They, they were the righteous use of mockery. And, and, and they told an incredible story. But the problem, the only problem Andrew had is he was alone. Only one other business joined him. Or Rona might have went very, very differently in Kentucky. Um, to tie off Max's story, Max walks into the you know, commissioner or whatever the head of the DACTAP is, um, and he has a camera rolling, because this was Max, just Ma you know, Max is Max. And the commissioner uh, immediately goes into turtle mode. If you've ever been, you know, bureaucrats act a lot like 11-year-old children who get caught doing something they shouldn't. You know how they have that like slunch posture and they like bring their head farther and farther down in the hopes that maybe they will disappear from view and you'll move on to something else with them. And so Max is like, hey, he's like, hello, so-and-so, this is Max Kane. But you already know who I am. <laughs> Because this is a guy who has basically spent four years trying to get Max Kane put into a federal penitentiary for running milk from Wisconsin into Chicago. And Max is sitting across from the guy chatting him up. He goes, yeah, he goes, you know, like, we've never really met face to face. We've obviously talked about each other a lot. He's like, I just want to have a little sit down with you. And this guy the entire time, he looks like he is sitting on a box of tacks. He's just like the most uncomfortable look you've ever seen. And, and Max goes, he goes, well, really, I have one question for you. And, and Max does this to the guy on camera. And he reaches down to a briefcase and he pulls out a sheet of paper. And he goes, um, he goes, is this your signature? And he slides it across the table. And, and the guy said like two words in six minutes of this video. And the guy's like, yes. <laughs> Uh, and Max goes, he goes, that's kind of funny. He goes, because that's your oath of office. And on that oath of office, it says that you are to protect my rights. And you're to serve the good of the people in my state. So I'd like you to explain to me what throwing me in jail has to do with protecting my... And, and, the, and it was just devastating to the guy. They ended up dropping Max's court charges. You can fight and win with the government. There, you know, I could tell more stories about different ways we did it. Uh, but, but know when you should fight. Know why you should fight. Make sure as a Christian, you surround yourself with good people who will check your ego. Because uh, again, it's easy to get, a, you know, it is fun to inflict pain on bad people. Um, and, and you don't want to become that person. Um, you don't, you know, you don't want to be the person who either dies the hero or lives long enough to become the villain, as the saying goes. Um, you want to do it for the good of your neighbors. You want to do it for the glory of the God. And then you really, though, we need to learn how to fight, whether it's within our denominations to, to make them sound and to hold on to them, whether it's in our local communities, we desperately need people who know how to fight.